I would like to impress you with the fact that the golf business has undergone a tremendous number of changes in the last few years, and there are going to be more changes. And there comes, there's going to come a time where the only thing that we have to offer as golf professionals to the clubs is our ability to teach. That is going to be the thing that is going to put us in, de in demand. Now, why is this so? Well, for one thing, as uh, you gather from Gary's talk this morning, expenses are getting way out of hand. If you have a club which is not interested, which is not interested, and always feels that the professionals are making too much money, uh, you're going to find that they can hire uh, just a little clerk from down the street, they take over the shops, and the professional business could die. And I see it coming. And so therefore, I'm doing my utmost to present a program to whoever asked me to present it with the idea in mind that we have to become better teachers. Better teachers. We have to have our students leave our classroom, the lesson tee, saying to us, that was fun. I enjoyed that. It's better. Instead of saying, my God, he threw so much stuff at me, I can't do it. And I'm sure that many of you have heard the comment, gee, I went to so-and-so, and I can't hit the ball now. Well, I think we have to change. I think we have to change. Now, I have listened to a lot of people talk about the golf swing. I have tried to do many of the things that they have advocated. That's fine, thank you. And I find that many of the things that are advocated, I can't do. Now, I have had a golf club in my hand since I was 14 months old. I still have the original clubs that I played with, which are about this big, which my father made for me. And my father-in-law put them in a little case, and they're hanging in my, in my pro shop. So I have been with this implement right here for 58 and a half years. Now, certainly someone who has been in the business that long in terms of playing golf and handling a golf club should be able to do some of these things that people talk about, but I can't. I'll give you an example. How many of you have heard of the counterclockwise theory that states that the fingers of the left hand rotate counterclockwise as they reach hip level in the forward swing? Now, you try to do it sometime. I had a young man come to my, sh my club to tell me that he had found the secret of the golf swing. There was no other way to do it. So he starts telling me about this counterclockwise theory of the fingers of the left hand at hip level, and before I asked him to explain any more, I said, let's go play. My first hole has a men's tee and a ladies' tee, and the ladies' tee is below the men's tee. Just a little hill, and there's the ladies' tee. So my dear friend hit the ball with his new infallible theory. He hits the ball, it bounces on the ladies' tee and down the fairway on the ground. So I said, that's all right, hit another one if you're just trying to prove something. That man played nine holes with me and never got a ball off the ground. Now there's the infallible theory. Now, can you imagine what is going to happen to a layman student, not a professional, a layman student, who goes to that man, and he's a good friend of mine, and I respect him for his interest, but can you imagine what the layman that pays $10 or $20 or $30 for his lesson is going to say to himself about the golf profession after he gets through the lesson of that type? And it not only hurts this man, but it hurts the profession, and that bothers me. That bothers me. I think that we should be able to help anybody, regardless of his problem. And when he gets through with his lesson, he has to be better than when he came. And unless we develop a concept which does that for us, we are really failing our students. 
Now, just as a little background, Jim talked about Ernest Jones, and both my dad and I really owe everything we are today <coughs> to Ernest Jones. My dad was a very fine player in his younger days, and he used to play the tour in Europe. And in 1936, he decided that he was going to come and visit Ernest Jones, with whom he had become very friendly through the years. And what prompted him to, to, to do this, God only knows. But no sooner had my dad arrived in this country, the Civil War in Spain started. And of course, my dad wanted to go back and get his family out. Well, Ernest Jones says, no, you're not going back to Spain, because if you do, you won't get out, and you won't get your family out, which would have been true. So he gave him a job in this country and held him here, and eventually, through all this documentation we had to get and so forth, and as long as my father was in this country working, we obtained permission from the government and the police and all the other people that we had to get permits from to join my father in New York. So this is how we, we arrived here. Now, at the age of 44, approximately, my father was, was penniless. He had nothing. And Mr. Jones loaned us $500 to buy a 36 Plymouth. $700. That's what a car was worth in 1936. Many of you are too young to know. So we got this little gray Plymouth, and Mr. Jones got a, a job for my dad at the Brookside Municipal Golf Course, which is a golf course surrounding the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. And there he met a man by the name of Eddie Luce. And Eddie Luce was a very fine player. Some of you older people might remember him. Uh, very fine player. And he took my dad. He needed an assistant, and he decided to take my dad. So my dad went to Lakeshore Country Club, and that's where I spent my, most of my, my youth and went to Highland Park High School and down to Northwestern. So that's how I happened to get into this area. So I have been in golf all my life, and I have not only enjoyed playing, but I have enjoyed making people improve. And primarily, I'm an instructor. I don't think I will ever get the merchandising award for being the greatest merchandiser in the world. I personally don't think that in order to sell a, a dozen golf balls, you need any particular talent. It doesn't take much to say, well, this ball has a lot of cover and this one has a furlong cover and this one cuts and this doesn't cut it doesn't take very much knowledge to do that but it does take knowledge work patience and understanding to teach and that's where the challenge for me is in golf so i have read a lot of other things about the game of golf and how it's taught and so forth i have watched other people teach and nothing has ever satisfied me like the earnest just concept now, what is the Ernest Jones concept? Well, people think it's something very odd, that you can't do it this way because it's simple. I mean, there's get various, various comments throughout my presentations about this and that and the other thing. But basically speaking, the only difference between the Ernest Jones approach to teaching and the golf swing and those who are advocated by other professionals is simply this. We work with the golf club. And I want to make that very clear. I don't care what your body does. You give me the right motion with the golf club. And then we can work and send the ball towards the target. I don't care whether the left knee goes out to the left. A person who has an artificial leg can't get it out there, but he still can play golf. Ernest Jones didn't have his leg below the knee, his right leg. He could still play great golf. But the thing that people forget, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is the only part that you have that hits the golf ball to your target. Now, when you decide on a system, it has to be understood. It has to be proven correct. It must be undeniable and it must be simple. It must be simple. I would like to know if any of you here can argue with the fact that if your wish is to send a golf ball to the target, that this club must move in the direction of that target. Can any one of you break that down? 
Can any one of you tell me it's not true? You can think about it until your year 2000, and you will not come up with a yes answer. It is true. There's no way that you can ever deny that statement. You can never prove that statement wrong. And that's what we want to get into God. We want to be able to develop a system of teaching which really cannot be challenged. And if it is by any chance, it stands up. And in my opinion, the only one that I have been able to do this with is the Ernest Jones principles. Now, Ernest Jones principles have been known for a long time. They have not been used probably because Mr. Jones was very narrow in his approach to teaching. Now, what do I mean by narrow in his approach to teaching? Very simply, that if you went to take a lesson from Mr. Jones, he would say to you, you don't swing the club head. He was a great believer in the fact that if you do it right, there's nothing wrong. And he told that to my father so many times when we were at each other's home, he would say to my father, but Angel, there's nothing wrong if you do it right. See, it's true. It's true. But on the other hand, some years ago when I was uh, vice president in, the, in our national PGA, I heard a little seminar, a little talk by a man who came to talk to us about teaching physical skills. And one of the things that he said, which I will never forget and I hope you'll never do, is that in order for a person to improve, he or she must know the difference between the right motion and the wrong motion, and he must be able to do them both himself. Then he has something with which he can compare. But to just tell a person to swing the club head wasn't enough. Wasn't enough. And this is what I blame for the lack of understanding of the Ernest Jones approach to golf. Now, my father changed that a little bit. He got a little broader. I've gotten even broader, and I hope that my assistants and those of you who might adopt the system will get even broader. I take great pains in explaining the right and the wrong. I take great pains in trying to get the people to observe through pro producing the motion myself with their hands on the club, the right motion, the wrong motion. And have them close their eyes and say, now you produce this motion, and I can feel whether they're doing it or whether they're not. And it all bears down to one very important word, and that is understanding. Understanding. Ninety percent or more of the people who play golf, including professionals, do not truly understand the golf swing. Now, the principles of the golf swing were written in the physics books and in the geometry books centuries ago. There's not a mystery. It's not a mystery. But everybody, you see, has a different interpretation of what he personally does. And what most people teach is what they feel they do. And I'm sure that you have found many people, including you professionals who teach yourself sometimes, as you say to yourself, gee, I'm doing this. And yet, one of you check him and he's not doing it at all. See. How many of you have ever come to one of your other professionals and said, gee, I'm hooking the ball, I'm coming over the ball? How many of you have ever said that? None of you? You're pretty good. Because I get it all the time. And you see, when you come over the ball, you can't hook the ball. You can only slice it. So many times we, even within ourselves, have certain feels that are contrary to what we really do. And when we're trying to teach that way, what are we really doing to our student? We're confusing him. We're getting him further and further away from what he has to do to be successful in the production of a good golf shot. 